Hi, how's it going everyone? We have a very special event for tonight. We're going to be talking with Kathy Stegg. Uh, she first taught Shakespeare in 1974 Four. Yeah. and has been teaching uh, Shakespeare at Bishop Ireton High School for the past seven, seven years. years. Um, so very pleased to have her on the channel um, and I hope you enjoy tonight's discussion. Tonight we will be talking about Shakespeare's sonnet number 73. Uh, this is not a sonnet that I am exceedingly familiar with, uh, but I trust my guest tonight um, will be able to fill in some, some questions I'll have about it. Um, so, um, Kathy, would you like to do the honors and read it? Sure. It's my favorite sonnet. And it's the wrong time of year. Let me just start by saying I know that spring has just started and it's in fact Easter today for those of us who celebrate Easter. Um, and this poem is not remotely about Easter, but we're just, we're winging it. It's a great poem. That time of year thou mayest in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well which thou must leave ere long. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, it's great, great reading. Um, I, I think you... Uh, enunciate those um, uh, antique uh, contractions a little better than, than I would. Um, when I looked at this sonnet, just, just over, over a, a little bit here and there, grabbing some time before we sat down, what, what really struck me so much was um, this is just not a typical sonnet opening. Um, so especially compared to a lot of the sonnets we've covered in this channel, there's oftentimes a certain vehemence of opening or contradiction or rhetorical mm -hmm. strategy of saying, I'm not going to do this or refuse or no longer, or, um, if this and, and kind of when or conditionalizing Shakespeare doesn't do any of that in this sonnet when so many of his other sonnets I feel like you do get a kind of a rhetorical or um, other other type of opening um, with conditionalized language why do you think this poem opens this way I don't know but that that is a great point so many of his sonnets and so many of his followers sonnets start with the adverb clause when blah 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 and right. I, I do that for eight or twelve lines when this when this when this right when this. it gives no you a lot this. of momentum to do that too and th this is just he's just fine with with essentially zero momentum coming into this first line like totally coasting here yeah and and i think and we talked about this a little bit before there is no there is no momentum there are three real solid quatrains and it's like He's laying bricks. He tells you the same thing three times in a row. Uh, excuse me, I'm getting old. I'm going to die. I'm not going to be here forever. And in case you didn't get it the first time, I'm going to say the same thing the second time. I mean, he does that. Look at the second quatrain. In me thou seest the twilight, right? And then the third quatrain. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that, oh, by the way, is going out. So it's... It is very different, but it is like the bricklayer, which, you know, we said Ben Jonson's father was a bricklayer. Shakespeare's father was not. He was a glover. But Shakespeare's laying layer on layer on layer. If you didn't get it the first time, I recognize my mortality. So I'm going to recognize it a second time and a third time. 
because this is what's on my mind. And I, I think that's just, that's what he wants to think about. And the fact that you, the beloved, you love me anyway. Right. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we get this mayest in the first line. So you get a little bit of that rhetoric that, that the sonnet lover craves. He gives you that mayest. This gives you enough to kind of float the sonnet out there. And what you're focusing on is instead of the vehemence out of that first line and into the first quatrain, he's going to build vehemence more like an architect would. Mm -hmm, he's going mm -hmm. to build it quatrain on top of quatrain. And for the reader, if you're if you if you just let it flow a little bit, by the time you're exiting that third quatrain, it's going to be ten times the vehemence of many other sonnets we've read. Yeah. So by the time yeah. you're done with this work, it's going to essentially, you're going to be totally against the wall in terms of forcefulness. So it's no less forceful than some of the other signs, right. ultimately. Right. But he's not, he's not building an argument. He's not right. doing the rhetorical, let me create something and then move from point A to point B to point C. I'm already there. I'm going to give you point A and then point A in a, with different images and point A with yet different images. Well, we do get this interesting hesitation from him in that second line. So that the first, my my comment there was, there was not as much vehemence. Then in the second, he hesitates. We have two sejuras, three, mm -hmm. with three commas. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he really is slowing the reader down. He's like, we don't need to rush. We're gonna take our time here. We're gonna go, uh, clause by clause, when y'all leaves comma or none or few, so it's almost apologetic. Monty I mean, Python, I'm not dead yeah, yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm going, but I'm not gone. Right. But nonetheless... Then you, you get a little vehement do hang, so it is asserting something there. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. they do hang upon those boughs, and the jam it there get a little bit of momentum out of that enjambment. Um, I find Shake Against the Cold, that's when I start to feel the, the fist of Shakespeare. It's a little more vehemence there. A little starts to get, the intensity is ratcheting up a little bit. Well, and also, when you get to the fourth line, yeah. right, suddenly you have a trochee, right? It's I am, I am, I am, I am. And then suddenly it's like mm. bear ruin choirs mm. that... He, that is an image you need to pause at. I mean, there there's a real need to think about that. Bear ruin choirs were late. The sweet bird sang, used to be something hot here, but not anymore, right? And and so he's looking at kind of the husk of himself. I mean, it, this isn't the winter of his life. It's the autumn that he's describing here, the speaker. But it's it's cold and it's emptier than he would like it to be. And that I find, and even 40 years ago when I love this poem, I find that profoundly moving. Bear, ruin, choirs. I mean, look at the way he just flips the I am's and suddenly we're, we're slowing down and we're thinking about there should be song here and there isn't. And that's really, that's sad, especially if you're a poet who used to sing like the sweet birds. Right. He's, look, he's looking at something that obviously we all look at. I look at it more now than 40 years ago when I first played with this poem. Um, but that that one flip, you know, look at the first three lines, right? That time of year when yellow leaves upon those boughs and then suddenly poof, we're going to take what you're talking about, which that, that slowing down, and I do love that in the second line, when yellow leaves, let me think for a minute, or none, let me think for another minute, Mm -hmm. Or few. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this is real introspection here, and then he comes to that interesting first punchline at the end of the first quatrain. Yeah, it's it's really really interesting to me because these first three lines are essentially painting. He's essentially mm -hmm. des describing mm -hmm. or observing. Mm -hmm. And I talk about the sonnet when we've looked at some other sonnets, how successful masters of the sonnet have such a keen eye and give us description. Bared ruins, by the time we get there, we're going beyond description. This is beyond the literal. This is metaphoric language. I almost thought of like St. Francis preaching to the birds. Because it's like, <laughs> oh. 
you know, there literally isn't a choir. There is no right. choir. Right. There's no people gathered. He's right. saying birds have left as if they were once a choir. Um, mm -hmm. And that metaphorical jump then starts to show us the type of thinking and the type of imagination that we're going to be grappling with in this poem, which the word ruin, when you find ruin in a poem, right. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, I mean, you're really in for it. I mean, any poet who uses the word ruin lightly is a very, very poor poet. And that is not what's going on here. No, this is a huge, huge giveaway. Um, he's talking to me, not just about his own life, but he's talking about what the power of language can do, what its limits are, what its potentialities are. And he's also giving you something that is so frighteningly modern um, yeah what a novel yeah. that i will yeah. never read again because it's too powerful and it and it's terrifying the road cormac mccarthy where the the apocalyptic vision the bare ruined choir the the nothingness mm. where there should be something there should be song there should be life there should be beauty i mean he gets that facing his own and my own more and your own mortality and it's just you know it, it's very pared down it's very stripped down but it's an incredibly powerful image so i think that is uh very very um i, I think what again that that very natural understated movement from observation and depiction and painting that how 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 easily it is for us to this color yellow just sticks mm. very vividly mm -hmm. and it's impossible to forget and that's going to be a big deal in this poem when we get into the second quatrain because yellow that color is going to darken or 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 deepen um and and become these other things um I know we're going to talk about about his use of the Volta and the <laughs> Volta structure in general, since that's kind of my obsession um, in this channel is talking about this pivot to the eternal. Um, and we were talking about this. You said this amazingly fascinating thing, which is um, essentially from the very first line, he's already pivoting. Um, would you describe why you think that's happening and, and why you think th this poem pivots so early? I, I think the, the whole poem is his pivot to the eternal. So he's there at the beginning. He is, he's pondering mortality and immortality as he enters the poem. That time of year, the time of year, autumn, which is obviously the imagery here, and then when he gets to his his sunsets and his embers and ashes, I mean, he is dealing with the move to the eternal. Right. So he doesn't have to wait until you know line nine right. to get there because that's that's the whole point of the poem. Right. Is facing your own moment where guess what i'm in the autumn of my life um uh, and and to already be there is you know for me that's why this poem is so unbelievably powerful it's i'm there i'm there i'm there and yet you are somehow okay with me the loved one right even though i'm, I'm looking at the next world from from word one of this poem that you are okay because you see something in me that is eternal you see something right. in me that is better than the fact that maybe my hair is grayer than it used to be when you first knew me um, so where are you on the on the volta on this one um i would love to hear your thoughts on whether the volta is has has as much power in a poem that is a a mason's poem you know of, i'm there i'm there i'm there well, I mean, so the, the, the turn has to happen, right? It's mm -hmm. got to happen. And Shakespeare um, has to follow these rules and was aware of these rules and, and a master of them in a way that, that few other people were. So I still see this poem as, as making these turns. Uh, it does make several right turns 
you know, after each quatrain, how square it is, how neat it is. Uh, but after the second quatrain, after death, second self. So that's, I mean, we, we could spend half an hour just talking about each one of these quatrains, mm -hmm. which we don't have time to do, unfortunately. But the introduction of, of death at the end of the, the second quatrain, to me, is a big setup. I mean, that, that's going to be pretty much an alley-oop type of setup mm -hmm. here for the slam dunk into the glowing of such fire. Um, and the reason why is because what he's saying, and to me, the way I read this, the first two quatrains, there's not a lot of positive things. So oftentimes when we look mm -hmm. at a sonnet, we look at the first quad, the, the, the first eight lines as essentially things are great, things could be good, you know, a lot, a lot of, you know, I may, maybe I like to party, whatever. And then there's this pivot, oh my gosh, life's going to end. I don't know what this is all about. And there's almost this stricken tone in a lot of sestets of, of, mm. a, of a tone of, of almost um, fear or panic or, you know, resignation. But this poem is going to enact a very different turn mm -hmm. on a, mm -hmm. in a very different perspective because all of this stuff is almost out of his system at the end of, of death, second self. And so that the, the change in tone for me is very, very subtle. He's too wise. He's too old. He's too knowing to suddenly see things in a totally different way. That would be a young radical perspective. Mm -hmm. This is a seasoned, seasoned fighter's perspective who can change a little bit of distance and knock you out cold all the same. So this small shift for me is in the fire in that the, the, the yellow from the first quatrain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. burns in and becomes this this powerful powerful seminal eternal fire not an ordinary fire not like a, a, a just like lighting a campfire type of thing he's talking about a, t a different type of passion well do you think that the word i mean i love to go drill down to a sure point, the word glowing do you think the word glowing is is the clue that can support your concept there because glowing is i mean we're still there right and and glowing is a very positive word absolutely right? yeah i mean his the, there's a tonal shift in terms of of, of his attitude towards this situation mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. away from ruin into the glowing and yeah absolutely um that that word would support it um and, and that is in the first line that's the line where you have your volta correct right Right. Right. And you don't have you don't have any words remotely like that until you get to that line. So I you know, I could bow before you on that, even though I'm so anti Volta in this poem, I think that, that you can read it that way if you if you look at a particular word. That it's not the death of such a fire, which is what he would have been doing in the first two quatrains. I mean he does talk about the deathbed where on it must expire but right now it's glowing like right, right now right and, and he's talking about right now you know he's he's talking about the future but also more importantly is what he gets to in his final couplet and that is always his punchline right what matters most is that that yeah i know the fire is not going to glow forever but it's glowing now and right. you are loving that glow now even though i'm not that which once i was you know that which we are we are as tennyson would say much later yeah, and the, the, the glow, um, you know, reminds me of some of his other sonnets, that the glow, as you spoke, was, was not literally that his appearance um, or um, his, his um, charisma is suddenly attractive in some way. It's this gift, I think, a divine gift. It's, it's a gift, you know, mm. almost like, um, you know, um, you know the, the gift of the word. Of, of to mm, be divinely okay. inspired, to be moved to to speak, um, and that that can last forever. His speech can last forever. And that's what the beloved, um, he's pitching that to the beloved. Hey, you know, like, um, I'm not always going to be um, the young, attractive dude who you fell in love with, but um, my words are going to be forever and and he does make that explicit in other sonnets i hear oh, yeah. A kind of, yeah absolutely a, a repetition absolutely. Of, of some of those themes. yeah but here instead of the the sometimes 
arrogant, sometimes just amusing, sometimes cynical. Hey, the reason that you're going to be remembered at all is because my right. poetry is so great. Right. Here it's, you see something in me, you know, perhaps my gift at words, that, that transcends the mere youthful or physical or what have you, that you see, you see the better thing. And so, you know, good for you. I mean, this is this is a right. poem where he's yeah. almost giving the loved one a little bit more uh, little, credit yeah, yeah, than usual yeah, because yeah. frequently it's it's. I mean, it's hilarious, but not quite as as complimentary. But here, it's you know, you get it, you get it. Yeah, he's he's you know? he's more of the, the the finger that points at the moon here. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I think, you know, Kathy, we could probably continue to um, look over the sonnet for, for an eternity, as, as many other people have. Since 1974. Right <laughs> on. Almost an eternity. <laughs> um, well, I think we should give our, our readers and our listeners a, a chance to, to reflect and think about the sonnet as well. And, and then, you know, if they have questions and they connect it to some other Shakespeare work um, or... Um, work of fiction or anything else, then, then they could weigh in and, and let us know. And, um, you know, we're, we're certainly good for follow-up, right? Absolutely. All right, right Absolutely. on. Right on. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you for visiting the studio. And, My um, pleasure. We'll tune back in soon. <laughs>